good last night. Oh yeah, yeah. The the children have done really really well. So um, let's see here if we why don't we for the sake of the recording have a brief opening prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for your saints of old who saw fit to uh, bring, to, to, to pay for and, and put in these stained glass windows that lift up Jesus in all sorts of different ways. And we ask that as we not only look at the windows, but also as we dig into your word, that you would open our hearts and our lives to every good and gracious gift that you have for us. We lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are looking at Abide With Me, which is 878. And it's one another one of those that has six verses. So we'll start with three and then we'll end with three. Um, so started here. Great words to get started. So as we um, make our beginning here, we're on the one that is window number nine, which looks like an A. It's over there in the corner, so you can't quite see it unless we get up and wander over there, but that's where it is. And uh, let me share that document online here uh let's see that's 12 that's the one right there so what we're looking at here is the greek letter alpha which is the beginning letter of the greek alf alphabet now this is often paired with omega which is the last letter of the greek greek alphabet and actually, omega is on the back of this sheet, even though, you know, and I don't, the windows don't actually have numbers, but I just started there and counted them all the way around. So this is really window 12, which is over here in this corner. And if you're wondering, wait a minute, from that corner to nine and that corner to 12, what happens? 
if you actually go up the balcony steps, you will find 11 there, and a 10, nine, 10 there, and 11 over here. And we'll, we'll get to those, but they're, they're kind of the hidden windows. So I don't know of a certainty. My guess is, is that when this sanctuary was rebuilt in 1925, now, recognize this space was enlarged um, somewhere in 1903. It was dedicated in 1905. And I think if, the, if I got the minutes right from Judy, that in 1903, there was a decision made, we need to enlarge the church. So this, this was a smaller structure, sort of kind of where we are. The pews were actually in a curve way back and you had an organ up there and you had an altar up there someplace some so i don't know exactly you know where the walls were in here compared to where we are now and in the early so in the very you know first decade of the 1900s this was the footprint right that this little wing was added here um and it almost sounds like that altar area was um reconfigured and the church was extended this way. So my guess is, is in that early decade of the 1900s, there was no balcony. Because the stairways to the balcony and that back wall split those last set of windows. The original windows were installed at that time. When the fire happened in 1924, there was a committee formed We've got the minutes on that to try and replace the windows that had been broken in the fire in a way that matched the ones that survived the fire. Which ones are which? I don't know that anybody other than God knows right now because the saints who are here then are not with him. <laughs> so, um, so it's one of those things where that's just a little bit of the history of this. So some of these go back to that first decade of, of the 1900s, and others of them were replaced in 1924, 1925 after the fire. And again, I, I can't tell. I mean, if I'm looking at them, I can't tell. I can't see obvious differences. So... <laughs> The way they do stained glass, I don't think it's changed over the years. Not much. Not much. I probably have new. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an old, old art. So if we get back to alpha here, alpha is always used to signify in the scriptures that Jesus is the beginning of all things. When it's used with omega, it's Jesus is the beginning and the end, right? So this is all about Jesus as God, and it's all about Jesus as Savior. So we've got that Revelation 21 passage that's kind of listed for us there. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. So in one sense, when we think about heaven, for those of us who are still here, <laughs> all right, it's a now and a not yet thing. Jesus is saying here, it's already done. I've given you to drink of this water of life. I've given you to drink of this, and you are already um, an heir of this heritage. But it's also not yet, because we don't fully see it yet, right? So we have eternal life now. That's been done. We don't see the fullness of that. And those saints who are in heaven are enjoying the fullness of that. 
And the absolute fullness of that happens at the end when God the Father says to the Son, now is the time, and Jesus returns, and those who have previously died and are with the Lord receive their new glorious body, and anyone who happens to be living at the time you know, is caught up in the clouds and we are changed. So we lose this mortal dying body and we receive that glorious new. And that's what the scriptures say. Now how all that's going to happen, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that it is going to happen, God's word is true. God's word is true. So some additional biblical perspectives, especially as it relates to Jesus as the beginning of all things or other places where he's kind of called the beginning and the end. If we go to John chapter 1, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell the story of Jesus. Kind of, it starts here and we go along and it ends here, right? And while some of them uh, will have parables in slightly different places and stuff like that, they're pretty well telling the exact same thing from three different perspectives. Um, Mark really was Peter's take on it. Uh, we have lots of testimony out of the early church that that's Mark was Peter's disciple and wrote that down for Peter. Uh, Matthew was one of the disciples. Luke was a Gentile Christian who traveled with Paul, but uh, pr has proven to be probably the best historian who's ever been alive. All right, so he may have been a physician too, but he was a really good historian. And he says of it in his own gospel, I have, you know, gathered the accounts from many witnesses. So in reality, when he gives all of these details, he's talked to people who were there, who saw it firsthand and has compiled all of that. John is also a disciple of Jesus. John writes his gospel before the end of the first century. The other three gospels are now in wide circulation. So as the Holy Spirit works through John to put his gospel together, John presents the same facts about Jesus' life in a, from a different viewpoint. A viewpoint of Jesus really is the beginning of all things and is the end of all things. Um, and there are some things in John that are unique. All right. There are some pieces here that uh, the Holy Spirit said, okay, nobody told this part of the story. You tell it. Um, and as we look at John chapter one, we catch the flavor of that right away. In the beginning was the word. Anybody reading this especially in those, you know, in the first century, but even today, reads the words in the beginning, and that should take our mind to Genesis 1.1. So in effect, what John is, is saying here by the Holy Spirit is recognize God created the heavens and the earth. Not only was Jesus part of that creation, but the other underlying piece here is that Jesus is recreating now to take care of what we did to ourselves in Eden and ever since. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. That's an incredible claim. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. The underlying um, understanding here is not only did Jesus create all things, but he also maintains or sustains all things. And, and we'll pick that up just a little bit when we get to Colossians. Um, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There, there is an understanding of that particular Greek verb that kind of says that darkness really hasn't um, accepted it or received it, right? So there's that kind of a piece going on in here as well. 
And ultimately, here's Jesus, the beginning of all things. We have another reflection of that in Paul's book to Colossae, one of the cities where he traveled, and by the Holy Spirit's power, a church began by hearing Paul's preaching of the gospel, right? And in as he writes to the church in Colossae, um, he lays out, you know, how Jesus really is um, the beginning and the end of everything, right? And so starting at verse 15, he's talking about Christ here. If you, if you go back a little bit, you'll see that he's talking about Jesus, the Son of God. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So this whole idea here, as a matter of fact, that whole firstborn idea kind of, I mean, there's a lot of places it goes in scripture, but one of them is in Romans where it says, and we know that in all things, God works to the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. We know that passage, right? From Romans eight, because those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the likeness of his son, that's Jesus, so that he might be the firstborn among many. And so we, we've got these connections that kind of go all over scripture. But here he is as the beginning. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now recognize what's being said here is it's not just the physical creation. It's not just me and you that Jesus created, right? He also created the entire spiritual realm, the entire universe, and all of that stuff, including us, are sustained by him. All things hold together in him. If he were to withdraw his presence, <laughs> everything would disappear, right? So when we talk about Jesus as Alpha and Omega, he's not only the beginning, but he's with us all the way through to the end of all things, right? So, and he is, Jesus is the head of the, the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So we see not only is it pointing to Jesus as God, it's also pointing to his humanity. And the fact that he took on our humanity and died for us so that we might live in him. It's just, there's a lot packed into this little section here. And, and finally, a, a kind of a last perspective on this, we're going to find in Revelation chapter 1. John writes just ahead of this. Um, that, um, you know, he was there and he's testifying to this. He was praying and this vision comes. And in these verses, he says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. That's a threefold description of God there. John uses that throughout the book of Revelation, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So we've got that expression again, that here's Jesus, the first one to rise, never to die again. And ultimately, um, we enjoy that with him. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, 
and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who was, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So we've got this clear um, linkage here, right, between Jesus and beginning and end. And, and we see this whole, he's from all eternity as God. He has a beginning as a human being when he's conceived in, in Mary's womb. But he goes to all eternity as God and man. He has not abandoned his humanity. That humanity still exists. It's been glorified. And someday we get a glorified body like his, right? Uh, uh, has not abandoned it. And, and ultimately, it's this thing like, hey, I'm coming back. So um, let's let me switch to Omega here. Um, yeah, let's see, that one is right there. So here is Omega, and again, we've talked about the fact that this is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. Um, nearly always paired with Alpha when we find it in the scriptures, it, and used to signify that Jesus is the end of all things, right? It really is about him. And again, um, the same passage from Revelation where he identifies himself this way, and we see that whole beginning and end. Um, so let's take a look at some additional biblical perspectives here where Jesus kind of points you know, these other ones kind of pointed to here he is uh, at, at the beginning and the sustainer of all things. And these kind of point to the fact that, hey, he's uh, here at the end as well. So as we go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, and um, basically we have this idea here as Jesus is on trial, all right? And recognize when he's on trial, um, this is before the Sanhedrin. I mean, he's got various trials going on this night. This is the one before the whole ruling council. And in verse 61, it says, but Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. And again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Now, we know from um, one of the other Gospels that when this question was asked by the high priest, he put him under oath in the name of the one true God. So there was almost a compulsion here to answer this. Um, and Jesus chooses to, and he says this, I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. So he's pointing to the end. <laughs> now, of course, they used his own words to say, of course, this is blasphemy. He's convicted himself. They were completely wrong, um, which I suspect they all know at this point in time. Um, <laughs> Um, and the rest of the planet will definitely at some point see him coming back in glory. And at that point, these words will have their fulfillment, right? So Jesus is pointing to the fact that I'm coming back. <laughs> All right. Um, he does the same thing with his disciples uh, prior to... Uh, the events taking place in the upper room and his arrest and so forth. 
So we'll take a look at that in Mark chapter 13. Um, now, by the way, if anybody's running around saying, hey, we know when God is coming back, this is one of the passages you can take them to. This is not the only passage. We have another one in Matthew, and I think there's another one in Luke. And, and the curious thing is, is in slightly different contexts. Um, but here Jesus says, no one knows that day or hour, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And he's kind of talking to them about the fact that his return is when God the Father says now. And he doesn't, you know, that is not, you know, it's one of those mysteries of the Trinity, right? <laughs> okay. And so what he says is be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. So in some respects, that's us, right? We are his servants with assigned tasks, while the master is, if you will, away. I mean, we know Jesus is with us, but you, you catch the idea here. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows at, at the dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So as God's saints living here, we live you know, when we see that Omega, it reminds us that he's coming back. And we're trying to pay attention to that. Um, the reality is this, that while we are still living here, uh, God the Father desires to work in and through us to strengthen his kingdom, to build his kingdom. I don't always know how that happens. I know that he's working there. And, and I think part of it is sometimes even me as uh, a child of God, I forget the fact that, wait a minute, it's not about the plans I have and it's not about the, the, all that kind of, it's about the fact that God the Father has me here for his purposes and is working through me. So in the uh, very back end of Revelation, we've got these words, of Jesus. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. All right. So actually these words are spoken by an angel to John. 10 and 11. Starting in verse 12, it's Jesus speaking. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So ultimately what he's saying is, I'm coming back. Watch. Pay, pay attention. So we've kind of got this little uh, piece here of Alpha and Omega. Jesus has beginning and end. Um, so having looked at that, window 10 is on uh, this north side of the church as you're going up the steps. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, it, it uh, is just, it's right there, and you can kind of see, actually, the little closet under the steps, if you open that up, you can kind of see the base of the window there below the steps, and the top of it's above, and the same thing is true over here, and so it's, it's like, you know, I don't know, again, I, I haven't discovered when exactly the balcony was put in, but when it was, they, they split those back two windows. So at some point, that whole back end was open. 
Um, and exactly when that was reconfigured, I don't know. Well, I wouldn't want to pay for a window that wasn't going to be seen, only from the outside. Well, that's just, <laughs> a, I, you can see it from the inside. You just got to go looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta go and you gotta know where it is. So they changed it after they sold the window. Somebody bought the window. Well, and again, I'm thinking that when this was originally expanded in 04, 05, whenever that was, there was no balcony back there, and this just went all the way back, right? And you just had steps coming up into the sanctuary. And nobody's living today that can tell us. No, no. And at some point then, there was a decision made to put the balcony in. And in some, in some ways, they did a great job, right, in doing that. Because even if you look, you know, the supporting pillar is back into the space so that you have space just to put a thin wall right down the middle strip of the windows. Mm -hmm. Because that's why the, that's why you've got the big bump out there is that's actually the supporting pillar for part of the balcony, and they tied into this other arch in the back here somehow. So it uh, been a great building. Well, it is. It, it it is, and it's just you know I, the other thing, and I was I just noticed I've just been noticing some of this. You know, even on the pews, um, you kind of have that arch pointing mm -hmm. up to heaven. You've got that on all of the face boards of the balcony. You've got it on all the face boards of this balcony. If you look at the doors coming into, not, not the one going to the school here, that one, but if you look at the doors coming in and out of space, you've got the same arch. You know, I mean, there's some phenomenal woodwork that's been done. Uh, I, I would hate to have to think about what it might cost yeah. um, to replace it at this point in time. <laughs> Not to mention finding craftsmen who could actually do it, right? Awesome. That's another whole Of course, we got the Amish folks up there. I'm sure they could sort it out. So we've got um, here the serpent on a pole. We'll get started. Oh, yeah. Change the, you're telling me to change to that diet, that uh, thing in here, and you're right. Don't want Kim to be lost. Yep. There we go. So we've got the serpent on the pole here. And ultimately, this is a symbol that has its origin in the Old Testament event that takes place in Numbers 21. So in the original event, if an Israelite was bitten by a fiery servant, the only way to live was to look at this bronze serpent that Moses had lifted up whole. It was a means of salvation. Now Jesus refer, referenced this regarding his own crucifixion being lifted up. So we see immediately, hey, here's a sign of Christ right here, right? So as we go to that event, in, Hebrew, in Numbers 20, 21, um, we're going to, I don't know that we're going to look at all of these other passages that are listed here, but it was just one of those things like, okay, let's track some of that down. I don't know if I got them all. Um, but in Numbers chapter 21, they are, um, toward, uh, the end here. Okay, um, of their 40 years in the wilderness. They're actually on the move toward the promised land at this point. And in chapter four, we hear they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. All right, so they're wandering um, south of the Holy Land here, trying to get themselves into a place where they can enter the Holy Land. God is leading them, and it says, But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Let's pause there. 
how many of these people actually came through the exodus? I don't think any. None of them. Maybe some of the older adults, because it was everybody above a certain age was going to die in the wilderness. Okay? So maybe some of the older adults, but the bulk of this people was born in the wilderness. And it's like, you, you drug us out of Egypt. It's like, well, so where did they get that? <laughs> Mom and dad. Okay. Um, you know, this is just an idea. You know, I, there's a phrase that I heard years ago called stuck on stupid. Um, well, they're kind of they're there, right? They're stuck on, hey, you dragged us out of a great place in Egypt. That They're forgetting they were slaves. They were forgetting they were mistreated. They're forgetting all of that stuff. They're feeling they're groaning under their slavery. All of that is yep, yep, not, not even anything we're thinking about. We're just thinking about the fact that we had all this food. And, and for most of them, they wouldn't have even known what that was because they grew up in the wilderness, right? <laughs> it's just kind of curious. Uh, sometimes it's almost, it's almost comical if it isn't so tragic. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. Uh -oh. <laughs> the people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. And when anyone who was bitten by a snake looked at the bronze snake, he lived. So here's the original event. So the question is this. If I'm an Israelite and there's little fiery serpents around, and in, in one of the resources I read, by the way, um, in this particular part of the world over there, those little snakes still exist. They're very deadly. They gave all sorts of untold trouble to British troops in World War II. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's kind of a curious thing that even in the modern era, <laughs> okay, these little snakes are still running around over there. Um, and they're called a fiery serpent because they're copper colored. So, and apparently they're just also not only deadly, but they're aggressive. So if you're in their space, they're going to attack you. Yay, how much fun can we have, right? <laughs> um, so at any rate, but if I'm an Israelite and I got snakes running around all over the place, and the only way that I can be saved if I get bit is to look at what am I probably going to want to do? <laughs> Stay close to the pole, right? Yeah. I don't want to have to travel a long way to see the pole because mm -hmm. you just don't know. I might drop a grenade on the way. Um, and ultimately, as we, as we think about this, we're going to kind of hang on to that idea. Um, now, again, I don't know that we're going to look at all of these, but just to kind of get a flavor of some of these, uh, as we go to Exodus 15, um, and, and actually this is, even at this point, is nothing new for these people because when Moses first shows up in Egypt and says to Pharaoh, hey, let my people go, um, and uh, hmm, Pharaoh isn't excited about that prospect. Um, he makes life miserable, and, and they already start complaining about Moses and God. But what we're going to see here is just a continual series of complaints. So in Exodus 15, 24, they have gone through the Red Sea. They've just had the big celebration that the Egyptians are all dead. They're moving into the wilderness as God leads them by the pillar of fire and cloud. And they get to this point. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Their favorite pastime was complaining. In chapter 16, in verse 2 and 3, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died in the, in, in the Lord's hand by, in Egypt. Yeah, let's see. If we were just dead, that would be better. 
this makes, you know, this sounds good to you. I don't know. It doesn't sound too good to me. Um, you know, but this is their reaction to life, right? Um, and basically what they say is there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. So what are they accusing? Not only Moses and Aaron, but by extension, God, you're bringing us out here to die a horrible death. And on it goes all the way through. Um, you know, we see a similar complaint in 17 uh, where it's, it's a thing. So they quarreled with Moses and said to him, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for, wa for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? So th there's a pattern to these complaints. The pattern is always, we were fine in Egypt, and you brought us out of there to kill us. In some, you know, by starving us to death, or by dying of thirst, or whatever. You know, all this time, and the amazing thing is, is God is remarkably patient. He feeds them, he gives them water, he does all of these things. What happens here is the Mount Sinai covenant. So recognize, and, and you know, let's just think about this. This group of people, they've seen the 10 plagues. They have seen the Red Sea part, and they walk through on dry land. They have seen all the Egyptians drown. And now they're at Mount Sinai, and the, the, there's thunder and lightning, but the mountain is not burning up. And God literally speaks to them in his own voice with what we would call the Ten Commandments. And they are so absolutely terrified of that, that they say to Moses, you go talk to God. We'll listen to you. We're too scared of him. And, of course, before Moses comes back down the mountain 40 days later, they're already worshiping false gods, right? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And all the way through here, you know, those passages in Numbers, we see the same kind of thing going on there that, um, you know, they are complaining. You brought us out here to kill us. Our children are going to become prey. Some of the early ones there in Numbers are um, along those lines. Miriam and Aaron now pose Moses, and you say, hey, we should be leaders just like you. Well, so Miriam turns leprous white as snow, <laughs> and Moses prays for her, and she gets better, um, you know, and then they send the 12 spies into Canaan, and the 12 spies come back, and they say, there's no way we can take this land. <sighs> Do you catch this? Now, before we, you know, kind of say, what is up with these people, what have we seen? Literally. God coming into the flesh as a baby. We're about to celebrate that. We have seen him, you know, through the scriptures, do miracles among people. Even in our day, we pray for healing, and God sometimes graciously brings that healing through Christ, right? We pray for provision. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to, you know, make things work right now in my life. And he provides for us, right? We've seen as great of things or greater than these people. And yet, I don't know about you, but I do like my complaining. Right? <laughs> Yeah. And in that, am I complaining because there's that lack of trust in God, which is really where these people are, right? They just have failed to trust him. Now, ultimately, you know, in Eden, Adam and Eve fall to the surface temptation to distrust and disobey God. The, Israel, the Israelites repeatedly fall into the same demonic temptation. 
And truth be told, so do we, right? So we've got some other pieces here and, and we'll probably, um, you know, somewhere pick up some of that. Yeah, we're close to time here. Um, we'll probably pick up some of that as we go next time. And we'll look at where Jesus does something with this in John chapter 3. And then we'll visit with King Hezekiah and find out what happened to this bronze serpent. Because we know what happened to the bronze serpent. And then we'll kind of uh, have a, a brief discussion on the potential connection between this and symbols that are widely used in medicine. So, at any rate, some things to look forward to. And then when we're done with this one, um, it's the one in this staircase is Luther's seal. I figured we'd do that one last. But the next two here are the Lamp of Wisdom and the Ten Commandments. So we'll, we're close. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, you started this all before the virus. I know. Well, but then we kind of took a break when the virus hit just because it's like it's really hard to talk about stained glass windows when, um, you know, you're – I'm not able to look at them. I mean, I, I got pictures of them. I guess on Sunday morning, because there's already a Bible study in here, I'm teaching this in the cafeteria. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, you're going to have to walk over there and, and look, you know. So, um, let's go back to 878. We've got three verses here, right? Verse 4. shall we? Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. Great to have you here. And like I said, we're so close. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and if I can get it to pay attention to me, 